So we are going to go over adnexal neoplasms for this lecture. Adnexal tumors are historically classified into four groups based on the structure of origin, follicular, sebaceous, eccrine, and apocrine. In general, tumors originate from multipotent undifferentiated cells and appendages. They can aberrantly express one or more lines of ependial differentiation. They may imprecisely resemble their mature counterparts. Rapini was once um, thought to say classifying snowflakes is easier than classifying adnexal tumors. So overview, we have sebaceous, pilar, and sweat gland neoplasms. It's usually easiest to recognize sebaceous because you can identify the bubbly cytoplasm within sebacytes and other poorly differentiated cells may have some sebacyte type changes within the cytoplasm. Try to exclude certain entities first in your differential diagnosis. You can think about doing immunohistochemistry for antigen receptor or EMA. Pilar tumors are going to recapitulate the uh, follicle and so you may have some areas that resemble more of the matricle area, more of the outer root sheath, more of the area where you have trichlinal keratinization. So we will go over this, but adnexal tumors, particularly pilar um, differentiation, will have many different expressions. And sweat gland neoplasms are going to have different patterns that we will talk about. This figure, I really like this figure because it really summarizes how you can organize and compartmentalize the adnexal tumors of follicular origin. So here you see a hair follicle. Here we start to get this transition from more of the, the matrical cells into the keratinized uh, material. That's where you're gonna see your pilomatricoma develop. So you'll have some areas of basaloid appearance and you'll have some areas of keratinization with the so-called ghost or shadow cells. People refer to them by the same name, but just understanding that you'll have some empty white nuclear spaces surrounded by this pink keratinized material. Fibrofolliculomas, they're more differentiated from the outer fibrous sheath of the hair follicle itself. So you do have some areas that look basaloid, but you'll also have a lot of fibrous stroma and maybe some fibromyxoid stroma. If you cut a fibrofolliculoma in a different section, it's thought that trichodiscoma and fibrofolliculoma are essentially the same type of tumor. And so you can imagine if, if you have some <clears throat> horizontal orientation of a fibrofolliculoma that if you rotate it and cut it in a different way, you may get mostly the fibrous stroma, and that's going to be more of a trichodiscoma. Trichoepithelioma is going to be derived from this area kind of by the dermal papilla, but also the matricle cells. And so you'll have this basaloid proliferation that looks a lot like a basal cell carcinoma. And in fact, a basal cell carcinoma, you can think of it as a malignant adnexal tumor. Oftentimes, this is where the burrep 4 is positive, the immunohistochemical stain burrep 4 is positive in this area of the hair follicle normally. And so that's why your trichopithelioma and your basal cell carcinomas often express burrep 4. And they look very similar. Trichopithelioma and basal cell carcinoma look very similar. And so you can compare and contrast some of the features of basal cell and trichopithelioma, and we will discuss that. And trichelomoma, this is one of my favorite adnexal tumors. It has this peripheral palisading on the edge, which looks very much like a basal cell carcinoma to many uh, pathologists. But the more you see this, the more you'll start to really recognize this palisading is lined by this thick pink basement membrane material. And oftentimes these cells within the island contain more of a clear cell change that you would see in an outer root sheath area. And so this is your trichelomoma. And interestingly, if you did a burrep 4 on this, it's usually gonna be negative. And if you do a CD34 on this, many times the clear cells will express CD34. So with your H&E analysis, as well as your immunohistochemical analysis, you can 
separate out tricholoma from trichoepithelioma and basal cell carcinoma. Much of the actual diagnosis is going to rely mostly on the uh, architecture and just the overall H and E appearance rather than immunohistochemistry, but there are some ways that you can help separate. So what are the six pattern of sweat gland tumors by basic histologic pattern? We will go over examples of this, but the patterns include dermal cyst with double cuboidal columnar lighting. You'll see that in a hydrosome or a cystadenoma. You'll see a pattern where you have solid paint clear squamoid proliferation and acrospiroma family, and we'll go over that. Blue basaloid proliferation in the dermis in entities such as spiradenoma, cylindroma, and malignant counterparts. Tadpole paisley tie is going to encompass syringoma, microcystic adnexal carcinoma, not included on this table, is going to be a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma as well, and a morpheiform basal cell carcinoma. Those are the malignant um, entities in addition to microcystic adnexal carcinoma that you need to be able to think about when you're looking at tadpole or paisley tie differential. And we have a video um, discussing those entities. Cystic spaces and papillary projections, you want to think about syringocystadenoma papilliferum, hydradenoma papilliferum, and digital papillary adenocarcinoma. And dermal nodule with variable mixture of cords, chains, tubules, and chondromyxoid stroma. You can think about a mixed tumor. It has a lot of features, so you think mixed tumor. That's also chondroid syringoma, so it has a very bluish hue to most of the tumor. It looks a lot like cartilage, so that's your chondroid syringoma. So starting out with sebaceous neoplasms, nevus sebaceous. It's also known as an organoid nevus. It's usually present at birth, but patients do not present until early adulthood. It grows and becomes waxy during adolescence. You can see it often on the head and neck, the scalp, and it's a yellow plaque that often causes an alopecia appearance. The tumors complicating a nevus sebaceous include a syringocystadenoma papilliferum or SPAP, trichoblastoma, sebacioma, and tricholoma. Here you can see a nevus sebaceous. When you look on the slide, you'll see acanthosis and papillomatosis corresponding to that kind of bumpy architecture on the outside, lack of mature hair follicles, sebaceous glands emptying directly to the epidermis, and that's an important point. When you see those sebaceous glands directly contacting the epidermis and not associated with a hair follicle, you can think about nevus sebaceous. And misplaced apocrine glands are also a feature, as you see in this slide. So the clinical and the histopathology line up really well here. You don't see hair follicles. That's where your alopecia comes from. You see that papillomatosis and acanthosis. You see some sebaceous glands opening directly up into the um, surface, and you see these misplaced African glands. Now, next to uh, nevus sebaceous, you can often get basaloid proliferations that will start to mimic adnexal tumors. So you may some, see some things that look more like a, a basal cell uh, with peripheral palisading and some clefting artifact. You might start getting evolving brichoblastomas. Uh, you may start getting syringocystadenoma papilliferum. So when you, when you see a nevus sebaceous, definitely look at the entire specimen and see if there's any adnexal tumor associated with it. There's many um, examples of multiple um, adnexal tumors within one nevus sebaceous excision that we've seen. Sebaceous hyperplasia, very common on the face of adults. Cyclosporin immunosuppression is associated with sebaceous hyperplasia. It's smooth yellowish papules that can have telangiectasias and look like a basal cell carcinoma. However, these are often more symmetric. They're more yellow. They don't have as many telangiectasias. They don't ulcerate. And they're typically not very big. So the size in this photo is kind of your uh, medium sized to even bigger sized sebaceous hyperplasia. They are benign, however, um, as, as you know, anything that is benign could give rise to a malignant uh, feature. And so we'll talk about different sebaceous tumors and their malignant counterparts. Sebaceous hyperplasia is not associated with mutatory. So when you 
think about sebaceous neoplasms uh, like sebaceous adenoma, sebacioma, and sebaceous carcinoma, which are associated with miratory, with sebaceous hyperplasia, that's not the case. Here is an example of sebaceous hyperplasia. So you might get a biopsy from a sebaceous rich area, like the face or the nose, where you're going to see sebaceous hyperplasia, but you're going to have a background, a high background of just lots of sebaceous glands around the follicles anyways. But this is more than what you would be expecting. You've got several well, well mature sebaceous lobules kind of palisading around these hair follicles, even extending down into the deep dermis, almost right up next to that subcutaneous tissue. So this is sebaceous hyperplasia, and this is a pretty robust example. Sebaceous adenoma and sebacioma are found in adults. So this is not the same thing, but they exist on a spectrum, and we'll talk about this. Sebaceous adenoma and or sebacioma can occur in Muir-Torre syndrome, where you have a loss of DNA repair mismatch proteins. Now we listed a couple here, MSH2, MLH1. There's also MSH6 and PMS2, which you should know. Sebacioma are basaloid cells at the periphery, and they represent more than 50%. So the cutoff that is usually taught is 50%. So if you have, and we'll show you examples, more than 50% of immature cells, that's going to be your sebacioma. If you have more than 50% of like well-differentiated cells, that's going to be your sebaceous adenoma. So here is an example of a more of a sebaceous adenoma. It's got well-defined lobules. It's got an architecture that looks benign because it's really encapsulated. And if you were going higher power, you shouldn't find significant areas of necrosis. You shouldn't find significant mitotic activity on higher power. You'll see that there's this kind of bluish rim to the outside, which you typically don't see this as much in a sebaceous hyperplasia, but you can. And sometimes it's a difficult to separate out a sebaceous hyperplasia and sebaceous adenoma, unless you have a big specimen here. This is a lot more than you would expect to see with sebaceous hyperplasia. So the, the outer edges look more blue than sebaceous hyperplasia, but they're not as blue as a sebacioma. You can see these numerous well-differentiated sebocytes in most of the lobule. Sebacioma, in contrast to a sebaceous adenoma, look how much blue there is. So it's greater than 50% of bluer cells, so less differentiated cells, but you still have scattered, well-differentiated sebocytes throughout the neoplasm. And in real life, if you get a superficial sample of this and it's got some overlying ulceration on top or erosion with serum containing inflammatory crust, it's going to be really difficult to completely exclude a sebaceous carcinoma. And that's the problem with this entity. And so um, this was a biopsy that, that kind of showed you that they got most of it here. There's like a collar red around the neoplasm and it gets pretty much underneath most of the bulk of the tumor as you can imagine it probably doesn't extend down too much, but you have to, to mention here that it's focally transected. You really don't know what's underneath this. How are you going to separate sebacioma versus sebaceous carcinoma? So you're going to want to, to make sure there's not significant areas of necrosis within a sebacioma. You're, you're going to want to see much less mitotic activity. You are going to make sure that it's encapsulated well, and it's not a really infiltrative aggressive architecture. Sebaceous carcinoma, on the other hand, is going to have everything opposite. They're going to, it's going to have an infil infiltrative architecture, lots of mitotic activity, lots of necrosis. It's going to be behaving badly if it's been going on for a long time. Um, but most of these, if it's superficially sectioned or superficially biopsied, I mean, then you're going to have to sign it out as an atypical sebaceous neoplasm favor, whatever you favor. But, um, conservative but complete excision if, if possible at all to make sure that you're not dealing with something more ominous down below in the deeper part of the section. Here's an example of relatively bland basaloid cells, right? And you have scattered well-differentiated sebocytes here. So this is a sebacioma. 
just a higher power example. You can see uh, the bubbly nature of the cytoplasm within the well-differentiated sebocytes. And most of these basaloid cells have very similar nuclear size and no significant mitotic activity. Moving on to sebaceous carcinoma, you can see here, this almost looks like it could be a melanoma or um, some other type of really malignant cutaneous tumor here on the right hand uh, panel. So it, it often occurs in older adults, periorbital area. I've seen many cases uh, where these arise just in the periorbital region. So if you see a tumor growing around the eye, differential is always going to have to include a sebaceous neoplasm. If it's on the eyelid itself, I often ask my colleagues in, in ophthalmology and oculoplastics to see if they can excise as much as possible, but also make sure that we um, obtain the aesthetics and the functionality of the eyelid itself so we can make a proper diagnosis in the beginning. And if, if it does look like a sebaceous carcinoma, um, and it continues to grow, then it's going to declare itself clinically because it's going to be very aggressive. These often will have a red to yellow um, hue to them with, the, with a lot of that sebaceous material being expressed. Aggressive malignancy for sure. And again, associated with Miratori syndrome. These are going to need to be treated with complete excision and in some cases radiation, um, depending on, you know, the uh, treatment plan of the oncologist, then you're going to have to have potentially even some chemotherapy or other experimental treatments uh, directly targeting the sebaceous carcinoma if it's metastatic. So here you can imagine a low power thinking about a sebacioma, but this is a massive tumor and you already can see this pool of necrosis here on the upper left part of the image, you see a lot of inflammation over to the right. And within these really basaloid islands, there are scattered sebaceous cells. But on higher power, you're going to notice mitotic activity. You're going to notice nuclear pleomorphism. You're going to, in addition to the architecture and the areas of necrosis, then you're going to have to favor a sebaceous carcinoma more areas of just examples of mitotic activity, one, two, three, four, five, on and on and on. As you scroll through, through these tumors, you'll find the mitotic activity is pretty conspicuous. Muratori syndrome, just a bit about it. It's essentially a subclass of hereditary non-polyposis colorectal carcinoma syndrome or HNPCC. It results in mutations and mismatch repair genes, resulting in instability of genes during replication in areas of microsatellites or repetitive DNA sequences. So think about MSH2 being more common than MLH1, but you also need to know that we test for MSH6 and PMS2 as well. If we're looking for the loss of expression of either of these DNA mismatch repair genes. So if you see that it's well expressed and all four of them are well expressed, then that doesn't support a loss and mismatch repair gene. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient does not have Muratori. You actually have to kind of correlate clinically, make sure there's no family history, make sure there's no internal malignancies, make sure there's no proliferation of other sebaceous neoplasms and eruptive keratoacanthomas. So we can't use the uh, DNA mismatch repair gene test as a, you know, complete definitive answer from your Tory. It's just a part of the puzzle and you got to incorporate it into the entire clinical picture. Moving on to pilar neoplasms. We'll start out with a simple one here, dilated pore of Weiner, first described by Weiner in 1954. It occurs on the face, usually solitary, predominantly in adult males, and has the appearance of a giant comedone with a central pore. Here you can see a clinical image of dilated pore of Weiner. On histopathology, you're going to look for a dilated pilar infundibulum, atropic epidermis near the ostium, and within a cystic cavity, you see this uh, hypertrophy with irregular thin proliferations. In the lower portion, you'll see small sebaceous gland lobules and bellus hair follicles. So here's a dilated pore of Weiner, a thick 
dilated ostea here with lots of keratin, reminiscent of even an EIC. You'll have these um, acanth acanthotic buds here, um, but it's not as much as a pilar sheath acanthoma, which we will talk about. Another example here. So pilar sheath acanthoma, in contrast, usually occurs on the upper lip of adults. Solitary skin-colored nodule at the central pore-like opening, and on histopathology, it has larger, more regular branching cystic cavity than a dilated pore of Weiner. Lobules are composed of outer root sheath epithelium, and it's been likened to a dilated pore of Weiner on steroids. So again, this is very dilated. It starts to even look more like an epidermal inclusion cyst, and then you have much more acanthosis on the outer portion. So yes, you may be shown an example that could be considered borderline and difficult to um, determine, but I would say if you've got this significant acanthosis on the outside, I would go with a pilar sheath acanthoma. Contrast that to the dilated pore of wine. Also, clinical location could help you out, right? So uh, pilar sheath acanthomas are more often than not on the upper lip of adults, whereas the dilated pore of Weiner, you are going to find them on the face. They're usually solitary. Um, at the end of the day, uh, they should show you something more like this, which is even more robust in terms of the acanthosis. So this would be a, more, a lot more clear-cut pilar sheath acanthoma. Moving on to trichofolliculoma. This is a fun one here because it um, often has multiple hair follicles leading into one central area on the section. You can really appreciate the daughter hair follicles leading into the mother hair follicle. It's usually a solitary lesion on the face of adults, small skin color, dome-shaped nodule, often with a central pore with a wool-like tuft of immature white hairs emerging from it. Those are known as trichoids. It's a diagnostic clinical feature. You can think of these as occurring with the genodermatosis Burt Hog de Bay. So very noticeable here where you've got these trichoids emerging from a central follicle. On histopathology, you're going to look for a large dermal keratin filled cystic space. And it would be nice to see that it's continuous with the surface epithelium. Radiating from squamous cystic wall are many small secondary vellus hair follicles, and that's where you get your mama and baby's phrase, catchphrase. The stroma is fibrotic and encapsulates the, the neoplasm, resembling that of a normal fibrous root sheath. So here you see multiple um, vellus-like hair follicles leading into a central keratin-rich mother follicular ostea. And then within this, you're going to find numerous hair shafts. And those are where your trichoids are emerging and they can exit out. In, and that's where you're going to get your multiple hair shafts coming from one follicular ostea there. Also, you can appreciate this thick fibrous band around the entire neoplasm, kind of holding it all together, collecting it as one single entity. Another example and these may not be oriented in the best way um, to be able to capture the larger follicular ostea emerging from the outer portion because it all depends on whether or not that cut lined up perfectly. Um, just like with an EIC, you're not always going to see the connection to the overlying surface. Uh, the keratin here looks a lot like that lamellated keratin that you're going to see in an epidermal inclusion cyst, and you'll also get lots of hair follicle shafts in there. A related entity, folliculosebaceous cystic hamartoma, kind of looks a lot like a trichofolliculoma, but you're going to have a lot more sebaceous lobules proliferating around a cyst-like space. Tumor of the follicular infundibulum is a solitary flat keratotic papule usually occurring on the face. It may clinically resemble a basal cell carcinoma, Occasionally, you'll find multiple lesions occurring in the same area. On histopathology, you'll see a plate-like growth of epithelial cells in the upper dermis, showing multiple connections with the lower margin of the epidermis. Some peripheral palisading, which can make it look a lot like a fibroepithelial tumor of pincus or basal cell carcinoma. Along the lower margin of the plate, there may be invaginations that resemble hair papilla. 
So you see this kind of reticulated neoplasm. Uh, many will liken this to a fibroepithelioma of pincus. You might see some basal um, palisading, basally palisading that will remind you of a basal cell carcinoma. However, you'll notice that the overall architecture of this is more plate-like. And uh, it's funny that tumor of the follicular infundibulum has been thought to also mainly arise from the isthmus of hair follicle. So it could be a little bit of a misnomer, but the quality of the neoplasm here, you, you really kind of get that appreciation that it's keratinocytes that are mainly derived from the follicle. And it doesn't have, it doesn't stain as blue as a basal cell carcinoma. It doesn't have significant retraction that you'd like to see with the basal cell carcinoma. These could also be uh, appearing similar as a reticulated seborrheic keratosis, but you don't really have great milia-like cyst areas. You don't have those pseudo cyst areas that you would like to see in a seborrheic keratosis. On higher power, just appreciating some of those areas that look like they're palisading. Um, again, this plate-like architecture to the tumor, to the neoplasm. Trichoadenoma is also another fun one. It's a rare neoplasm of solitary face and buttocks on adults with small asymptomatic yellow or red nodules that may mimic VCC clinically. Um, the histopathology for a trichoadenoma, you're going to find numerous foreign cysts present throughout the dermis. Some people have likened this to owl eyes. The horn cysts are surrounded by eosinophilic cells resembling those of a trichoepithelioma. So Lots of just these small little milia like cysts throughout the neoplasm. Fibrofolliculoma, these are often occurring together in multiple areas. The well known association is going to be Bert Hogg de Bay. So think about fibrofolliculoma, also trichodiscoma, which is thought to be uh, essentially in many cases the same neoplasm, but just sectioned differently. These are, they can be isolated. They can show up on the third decade of life, presenting as yellow, white, smooth, two to four millimeter papules on the scalp, the forehead, the face, and the neck. You can see umbilication, and you can see that they sometimes are going to contain hair. On histopathology, the center of the lesion has a hair follicle. With, you can see some surrounding loose connective stroma with numerous thin anastomosing bands of the outer root sheath. So when you get these kind of isolated anastomosing strands kind of by themselves, it almost looks like a tumor of the follicular infundibulum that we talked about, but it's now kind of oriented. It's vertical instead of that plate-like growth. It's coming downwards here, and um, there's this surrounding fibrous connective tissue stroma around it. You can see over here as well. Over here, you can see some mature hair follicles within the center. Um, so this is actually a fibrofolliculoma. If you were to get mostly fibrous tissue, you can think about it as a trichodiscoma, and those are often kind of more mitt-shaped in terms of the low power. Here is a good example of a fibrofolliculoma. Again, it kind of looks like that tumor of follicular infundibulum, but it's kind of rotated now and going more vertical, but it has a lot more of that fibrous connective tissue stroma. So this is where you get your fibrofolliculoma. I often try to remember these entities based on the name and think about how it lines up with the histology. So fibrofolliculoma. Trichodiscoma is considered, if you go down to the last point here on the slide, a fibrofolliculoma without the central hair follicle. And again, this is why many think that they're the same entity because it's it's been said that many trichodiscomas turn into a fibrofolliculoma if you section through them. These are often yellow, white, smooth, two to four millimeter dome-shaped lesion, exactly like a fibrofolliculoma. Multiple lesions can occur like in Bert Hogg de Bay. So again, it's starting to kind of emerge here that this is probably the same entity, but depending on the section you're looking at. Here's a trichodiscoma. You can see some areas that you can imagine looking like a fibrofolliculoma. You even have a dilated area of the follicular osseo with lots of keratin in it. This, as you can maybe imagine, looks a little bit more like a mitt, a catcher's mitt, um, or you know something you'd wear outside to protect your hands from the cold. This is 
again, in Durham path, people imagine things and then we just keep repeating. Yes, it looks like that. But uh, there have been a lot of examples where it actually does look like a mitt. I think their test test writers are trying to help us out here. But this is um, trichotoscoma mainly because you've got a lot more collagen here. You've got more fibrous tissue to look at compared to your anastomosing strands that you might see in a fibrofolliculum. At the end of the day, the most high yield association for this is going to be its association with Bert Hogg de Bay. Here, you don't really appreciate a significant amount of uh, what you would classify as an axonal neoplasm. It's mostly just fibrous. And it's important to keep in mind that if you section deeper into the block, you may actually reveal something that looks a lot more like a fibrofolliculoma over here on the left side. And the right side is just a lot more fibrous. Moving on to trichopithelioma. These are often confused with basal cell carcinomas histologically, and they're very related. Clinically, they are not behaving as badly as a basal cell. So they're round, they're skin colored, they're firm, they're symmetric, they're not often ulcerating, they're not malignant. And so, um, but it could be something that is getting irritated or clinically the patient doesn't remember how long it's been there. It looks like it could be a basal cell carcinoma. It could also be associated with syndromes like Brooks-Spiegler syndrome. And you can find a lot of basal cell carcinomas in Brooks-Spiegler as well as other adnexal tumors. So um, with Brooks-Spiegler and the CYLD mutation, you're going to potentially have basal cell carcinomas and trichotheliomas. You're going to have cylindromas and spiradenomas all in the same patient. Example, clinically, you have multiple trichotheliomas around the nose here and spreading out radially around the nose onto the central cheeks. On histopathology, you'll see islands of basophilic cells surrounded by a fibroblast-rich stroma. You'll identify some horn cysts and keratinization, and the keratinization will have some areas that is complete. That's known as tricholimal keratinization as opposed to horn pearls in a squamous cell carcinoma you will be able to appreciate if you have enough papillary mesenchymal bodies, which are fibroblastic aggregations around the basaloid islands. So here is an example of a trichopithelioma. You may, it may get confused at low power from a basal cell because you've got these basaloid islands, but notice these, these uh, keratin filled spaces here. So that's more in line of a more well differentiated basaloid neoplasm, and you don't often see this in a basal cell carcinoma. In trichopitheliomas, you're going to have less areas of retraction around the neoplasm. It's going to be smaller. It's not, typically not going to overgrow itself. You will also find some fibroblastic rich areas that look like they're the papillary mesenchymal bodies as well. Going back to this slide here to summarize, you, you'll lack high-grade atypia and mitotic figures, which you'll see often in basal cells. You'll be able to find the papillary and mesenchymal bodies present. Trichopitheliomas typically do not have a lot of myxoid stroma. They don't have a lot of mucin compared to a basal cell. They don't have a lot of retraction artifacts. This is a um, somewhat high yield practically that they retain Merkel cells. So they retain CK20 positive cells throughout the neoplasm. Trichopitheliomas will retain that, whereas basal cells will, it will be difficult to find retained CK20 positive cells in a basal cell. These are both going to be BRUP4 positive. So BRUP4 in basal cell and BRUP4 in trichopithelioma. That's not going to help separate the two. BCL2 is considered to be more diffusely expressed in a basal cell, whereas it's just more expressed on the periphery of trichoepitheliomas typically. Here you can see the peripheral palisading that often is confused with the basal cell carcinoma, but if you notice the retraction is mainly in the collagen outside of the tumor, and it's not really occurring between the neoplasm, the basaloid, islands themselves and the surrounding stroma.
So the retraction is located within the stroma as opposed to right next to the basal neoplasm. You also see these keratin-like cysts within the neoplasm, which you don't often see in a basal cell. And the cells typically look pretty bland. You don't see a lot of mitotic activity or nuclear pleomorphism. A high power example showing you is fibroblastic rich proliferation here, papillary mesenchymal body. Just more examples. Again, this is trying to recapitulate a follicular based neoplasm. Desmoplastic trichoepithelioma is, is an interesting spin on the traditional trichoepithelioma. You have a distinct clinical and histologic variant of a trichoepithelioma with desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. Almost occurs on the face, almost always occurs on the face. It's anywhere between three to eight millimeters typically in diameter. It's markedly indurated. It's often raised with an annular border and a depressed center. Interestingly, it can resemble granuloma annulari. Of course, it can also just resemble any other uh, type of cutaneous neoplasm, depending on if it's been irritated or not. More common in females than in males. So the classic clinical scenario is a donut-shaped papule on the face of a young female. Usually occurs in early adulthood. Here, though, look at the bottom left picture. You've got this central kind of irritation, ulceration. So no one would blame anybody for thinking about a basal cell carcinoma here. And so your differential is always going to include that. On the right, this looks a little less scary because you have intact epidermis on top, but it does have this central um, kind of indention and then an outer area that's raised here. So that's kind of where your donut shape papule comes in. On histopathology, you're going to look for three characteristics. You're going to want to see narrow strands of tumor islands. And that's why it looks a lot like a morpheiform basal cell carcinoma. You're going to want to see horn cysts and a desmoplastic stroma. Now, in contrast to microcystic adnexal carcinoma, you'll want to see actual ducts instead of horn cysts. With, in contrast to a, a morpheiform basal, you're going to want to see that there are some areas that are thicker often and that have a lot more mitotic activity, a lot more nuclear pleomorphism. You might find some more significant retraction between the spiculated islands and the surrounding stroma. The tumor strands are usually one to three cells thick and they're pretty small basaloid cells. Considerable amounts of dense collagen and hypocellular stroma are present on the outer part of a desmoplastic trichothelium. So from low power, you're noticing those cysts again. It's more frequent to see calcification in a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, but then these central islands that are more spiculated, they're only one to three cells thick. If you only got a small sample of this, it would be difficult to rule out a morpheiform basal. And so you really have to kind of get around enough of this thing so that the pathologist can assess the architecture and be able to say, you know, it's not infiltrative. The cells don't look bad. Oftentimes you need a lot more of the tissue to look at to definitively exclude a morpheiform basal cell carcinoma. As expected, these are going to have some burrup 4 positivity to them, but it shouldn't have as much diffuse BCL2 expression as a morpheiform basal cell. And you should be able to find some retained CK20 positive cells in this entity as well. So trichoblastomas can often be large neoplasms. Um, they can be uh, resembling something very ominous here. Uh, you've got this large kind of pink uh, nodular growth here on this uh, patient. And then here, this actually, it can take on more pigmented areas. So trichoblastomas can occur in nevus sebaceous as well. So Oftentimes, these are biopsied suspecting some type of cutaneous malignancy or adnexal tumor, which in this case, it's an adnexal tumor. Um, and what are you going to see on histopathology of a trichoblastoma? You're going to see that trichoblastomas are typically more bottom heavy. They're located in the dermis, but they can extend all the way even into the subcutis. Most of the examples for teaching of trichoblastoma include these really large um, basal tumors like this clinically, you can imagine how big this is on the slide. So they're just massive basal proliferations. 
um, when you go to actually look at the cells themselves, they don't have as much retraction as you're normally going to see uh, with the surrounding stroma, as you would see in a basal cell, you're going to find a fibrocellular stroma similar to what you're going to find in a basal cell. So here it, you can appreciate that even parts of the trichoblastoma look quite different than other parts of it. So over here on the right side, you've got something that's a lot more tightly compacted with basaloid islands, and it's got this kind of trichoepitheliomatous architecture to it. And over here on, on the left side, it's got some areas of like central clearing. It's probably producing more mucin. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's kind of a fine line to really separate out base, a large basal cell carcinoma from a trichoblastoma. But again, these other fine features that we talked about where you don't have as much retraction, you don't have as much, um, mitotic activity in, in nuclear pleomorphism, uh, in, uh, kind of the, the main parts of the tumor are going to show this mucin production, which you're going to see in a basal cell as well. I, I tend to think of a trichoblastoma as a very, um, poorly differentiated family member of a basal cell. So the fact that it's growing large and the fact that it's you know, um, it may not be infiltrative, it may not be ulcerating, but it's, it's growing large and it's encapsulated. So to me, there's not much difference between uh, how we're going to want to treat this because at the end of the day, you're going to want to remove this from the patient. You don't want this to continue to grow and de develop an even more malignant behaving population within it. So depending on the growth status of a, a tri trichoblastoma, you might see more mitotic activity than in other trichoblastomas, which are smaller and more indolent and not growing a lot. Um, but nobody's ever going to argue that trichoblastoma and basal cell carcinoma look very identical, depending on if you just got a small sample of this, right? So you really have to look at the entire architecture and you can see um, the scale bar on this picture. So it's three millimeters over here. And so this is well above one centimeter, probably approaching two, two centimeters. Um, so it's quite large clinically as well. Now you can get basal cell carcinomas that are exactly the same size, obviously, um, but you'll notice this really well encapsulated nature to a trichoblastoma. And so let's contrast that. Um, it's more difficult to contrast a trichoblastoma with a basal cell carcinoma. But some trichoblastomas are going to be a lot smaller than these other examples that I showed you, which there's areas that look a lot like a basal in here. So if you want to think about it in terms of more benign behaving at nexels, here, the trichoepithelioma, you can see that you've got these keratin-like cysts, right, that are almost like seborrheic keratoses within this area. But in a trichoblastoma, you have a lot less of those. You also have this more palisading architecture to the trichoblastoma. You have some more fibrous stroma that takes on a more of a spiculated appearance here in the center of some of these lobules. Um, and it, overall, when you look at this, it, it definitely looks different than a trichoepithelium. If you got just a superficial shave of this, you might consider a basal cell carcinoma. This is, um, not producing as much mucin as a basal cell carcinoma. You may not see as much mitotic activity. You might not see as much uh, nuclear pleomorphism in this type of trichoblastoma as compared to this type of trichoblastoma, right? So um, they're not all created equal. And it really just depends on clinical scenario um, as well as the overall size, architecture, et cetera. But at the end of the day, trichoblastomas and trichoepitheliomas and basal cell carcinomas are all very closely related. It's just that basal cell carcinoma is much more common than a trichoepithelioma or a trichoblastoma clinically. So um, you're probably going to see mostly basal cell carcinomas in your normal sign out. However, for testing purposes, trichoepithelioma is extremely high yield. Trichoblastoma is also going to be an important point of contrast in your adnexal tumor differential.
I think of uh, trichoblastoma as just look, imagining these basaloid islands blasting apart and just kind of forming this explosion, this kind of, it almost reminds me of like a nuclear bomb, the cloud that goes off um, in a trichoblastoma. So they can be pretty expansive. So your differential here, you can just see some more examples of the basaloid islands um, often can be seen in a trichoblastoma. So your differential diagnosis for a trichoblastoma is obviously going to include um, trichoepithelioma and basal cell carcinoma, as we just mentioned. The trichoepithelioma, in contrast, has um, cystic areas with keratinization is typically CK7 negative. And the basal cells, they typically don't have any papillary mesenchymal bodies, and they have retraction artifacts. In contrast to trichoblastoma, you don't see as much retraction artifact. You may not see pap, uh, you can see papillary mesenchymal bodies in a trichoblastoma, right? So this is a little bit um, more to your benign spectrum than, than anything to worry about malignant spectrum. But at the end of the day, if this thing is growing clinically and um, you didn't get all of it out, it's better to just remove it all and make sure you're not dealing with something that looks worse in a different part of the tumor. Trichoblastic carcinoma. So this would go into that idea of better make sure you kind of get it all out because you can have uh, more aggressive carcinoma arising from a trichoblastoma. So it displays infiltration, cytologic atypia, and high mitotic activity. So this would be even more difficult to probably separate from a basal at that point. However, you might find a benign trichoblastoma and then you have this conversion in the later part of the tumor to a trichoblastic carcinoma. So just an example of um, some of the nuclear pleomorphism in atypia you could see in a trichoblastic carcinoma. Lymphadenoma, also known as an adamantinoid trichoblastoma, it's a slow-growing firm papular plaque, usually on the face with a wide age range. Again, your differential clinically is going to be a basal cell carcinoma. It could be some type of a nevus. It could be anything that's going to give you this skin-colored papule with overlying phalangiectasia on the face. So on histopathology, you'll find tumor islands with often one to two layers of basal cells peripherally with centers of each island having clear cells and inflammatory cells with increased dermal dendritic cells. So here you see these aggregates of these lymphoid follicle-like structures. You can see those uh, clear cells in between with the inflammatory cells as well. From low power, you might think of a basal cell carcinoma because it's got some palisading with some clear cell. So you might think of a basal cell with clear cell differentiation on your differential diagnosis. But this looks much different than a basal cell carcinoma on high power because you see it's mostly these kind of like lymphocytes and even kind of histiocytoid looking cells within the center of the island. You don't have retraction artifact on the outside too, as you would expect to see with a basal. Moving on to proliferating tricholemal tumor. So proliferate, proliferating tricholemal tumors are also called proliferating pilar cysts. I tend to think of a cyst as sounding more benign and a tumor sounding more malignant. And there are some papers out there that talk about uh, more uh, infiltrative perhaps, or uh, a tumor that has more atypia or more mitotic activity in it. Um, so you're gonna hear both the terms prol proliferating tricholemal tumor and proliferating pilar cyst, which more often than not are resemble the same entity for all intents and purposes. And what you're going to see is a large tumor often on the scalp. So the same area as a pilar tumor or a pilar cyst rather um, with well circumscribed architecture and lobules of squamous epithelium and center uh, within the center, you'll find trichlinal keratin cysts and small foci of calcification are often identified in the areas of amorphous keratin. So in the same way that you've got this trichlinal keratinization and this abrupt transition from the uh, more basal cell uh, population to straight up into the compact keratinization, you're going to find the same thing in a proliferating trichlinal tumor. 
but you'll see the architecture is you've got these rolls and scrolls as they are liked uh, to be called in textbooks because you have these kind of, it's looking like scrolls cut on cross section and they're all bundled together. Um, within low power, a large nodule that's pretty well encapsulated and not invasive. So uh, to go back to some of the uh, just kind of factoids about a proliferating tracheal tumor here, um, it's typically a single lesion on the scalp mostly and 90%, but they can occur on the back. 80% of them are in women and most are in the elderly. They can be benign uh, or they can begin as a subcutaneous nodule that grows into a large elevated lobulated mass. It can resemble a squamous cell carcinoma and it can undergo ulceration as well. And that's why I'm talking about having probably a spectrum of more indolent proliferating trichelemal cyst-like tumors versus a more proliferating trichelemal tumor that you might want to just make sure it's completely gone, depending on what the pathologist notes in their examination. It's often treated with wide local excision and close follow-up again, because you may have some kind of malignant population transformation if it's not completely gone. Just another example of the trichelemal keratinization you're going to see within a proliferating trichelemal tumor. Now, the malignant proliferating trichelemal tumor, and this is why I say that oftentimes it, I prefer to call it a proliferating trichelemal cyst in the more benign entity is because you might have a malignant proliferating pilar tumor here. So with a malignant proliferating trichelemal tumor, and the key is the malignant, you have extensive areas of severe atypia and invasion of the surrounding tissue. So if you have a well encapsulated area and then it goes really deep into the tissue and you don't get it all, then you may not be able to say that there isn't some malignant proliferating trichelemal tumor to that. Uh, and that's why I think conservative but complete excision is definitely recommended when, when these are being first removed. You'll still be able to see the areas of trichelemal keratinization. However, tissue invasion, nuclear atypia, and giant nuclei indicate malignancy. So when I get the proliferating trichelemal tumors, I try to essentially look at every I, I look at every piece that I can examine here because if I find anything that looks atypical or anything that looks like it's not encapsulated anymore, I want to make sure I note that um, because the patient is either going to need you know, another conservative re-excision in that area, or they're going to be need very close clinical follow-up. Recurrence can be expected uh, with anything that is not completely removed. You can see the uh, malignant proliferating trichelemal tumor is going to have areas that look start to look more like a squamous cell carcinoma, where you get these atypical glassy islands starting to infiltrate into the surrounding tissue. Pilometricoma, uh, a fun tumor for sure, also known as calcifying epithelioma of Malherbe, occurs on the head, often on the cheek, the upper extremities, the neck, the trunk, and the lower extremities. Oftentimes it's in younger patients, the first to second decade of life, females greater than males with low recurrence. It's associated with several syndromes, including myotonic dystrophy, Gardner syndrome, Turner syndrome, et cetera. If you find more than six pilometricomas on a patient, then you should definitely be looking uh, for an association with some type of syndrome. So again, the pilometricoma differential or the differentiation area you can think about arising at this peak point between the more basaloid cells of the matrix and the area that starts to produce the, the hair shaft. And so that's where you're going to get that mix of basaloid cells as well as the uh, ghost cells or the shadow cells, depending on your preferred term, where you have an empty skeleton of uh, essentially a shell of what used to be a cell lacking a nucleus. So histopathology, you'll find sharply demarcated dermal tumor, often surrounded by connective tissue capsule. The tumor islands have basophilic cells and shadow cells with distinct border and central nuclear shadow often small, round, eosinophilic centers of abrupt keratinization. Rupture is common, and you can get the associated giant cell reaction, calcium deposits in 75%, and ossification in 15 to 
So again, pilometricoma areas of basaloid and more eosinophilic areas with shadow cells. If you see a biopsy that contains shadow cells like this, then it's a pilometricoma. You're not always going to need to find the basaloid um, areas, but it should have it if it was completely removed. But if you just have a small fragment and you see these shadow cells, it's pretty much a pilometricoma. It's thought that beta catenin is activated in these tumors. And so you may see questions related to knowing that you have higher beta catenin activity in these neoplasms. Unfortunately, you can have a pilometrical carcinoma, which looks like a pilometricoma, but it's got all of the other features that you'd be expecting in a carcinoma. So large infiltrative growth, maybe even lymphovascular or perineural invasion. Basaloid cell predominance, atypical mitotic figures in nuclear pleomorphism with prominent eosinophilic nucleoli. These are rare, and it's essentially just a malignant counterpart of pilometricoma. They're often seen more in males and in older patients, and, are, and unfortunately, they arise from pre-existing pilometricomas or de novo. They have a high recurrence rate of 60%. A pilometrical carcinoma here, you can see it looks like a pilometricoma with those basaloid areas and more eosinophilic areas with shadow cells. But again, it's more infiltrative. You're going to be able to find a lot more nuclear atypia, pleomorphism, infiltrative growth, necrosis, etc. These cells are highly atypical in most of the classic cases. You can see extremely large nucleoli, nuclear pleomorphism, et cetera. Trichloma is, is one of the more fun anexal tumors. People remember its association with cowdens because cows say moo and they think of trichloma. So that, that's the most common way to remember its association with cowdens. These are sol uh, solitary small papules in the face of older adults. They can arise in nevus sebaceous. With Cowden's disease, you're going to have multiple trichloromas. That is a, a disease that's associated with a P10 mutation on chromosome 10Q22. It's autosomal dominant. The ratio of female to male is approximately three to one. Patients with Cowden's have an increased risk of breast cancer and thyroid cancer, among others. And they also have multiple other types of neoplasms, so acrocordons, acrokeratoses, vitiligo um, is often seen in these patients. They can have lipomas and hemangiomas, neurofibromas, schwannomas, anthomas, etc. Cowden's disease is cobblestoning on the tongue as a classic codochrome. You can have these acral keratoses, as we mentioned. Unfortunately, uh, risk for breast and thyroid cancer as well. On histopathology, you'll find that the lobules descend from the surface of the epidermis into the dermis. So it's got an endophytic growth architecture. You can find variably clear cells and they have increased glycogen content. So that's why they look more clear. Again, think about the outer root sheath and how clear those cells are in the outer root sheath. And you'll often find cells that are that clear in a trichloma as well. Remember, that's where the trichloma is coming from on this panel to the bottom right from the outer root sheath here. You'll find palisading of the columnar cells, and this is why it was often confused as basal cell carcinomas um, historically, and they have a thickened hyalinized basement membrane zone, which is key to the diagnosis here. So you see um, this downward endophytic growth of the neoplasm with this peripheral palisade and these clear cells, monotonous clear cells within the body of the neoplasm. Again, higher power, you can really see and appreciate that thick basement membrane-like material surrounding, and then the central clear cells. I always like to, it, sometimes these cells can be quite basaloid. These tumors can stain white basaloid, depending on the hematoxylin in the lab that's being used. And so if it looks like a basal cell carcinoma, I often recommend that people do a burrup 4 stain to demonstrate that that's negative, and then also coupled with the CD34 stain, which will highlight these more clear cells here. But most of the time it can be, uh, the diagnosis can be made on H&E uh, analysis alone. Desmoplastic trichloma is a variant of this. So desmoplastic trichloma, 
You have solitary lesion. It's more commonly in males, the slow growing dome shaped papule. As we, um, when you hear about a dome shaped papule, think about desmoplastic trichoepithelioma as well. And so desmoplastic trichoepithelioma can show similar clinical features. This entity is not associated with Cowden syndrome though. On histopathology, you'll want to look for a regular extension of cells of the outer root sheath that project into the sclerotic collagen bundles and mimic invasive carcinoma. Superficially, the lesion shows changes of a tricholoma. And so that's where you're going to be able to make the diagnosis. So there's areas here that look like a tricholoma, but really in the center, you start to see this desmoplastic architecture, this kind of inward and outward diagonal and cross intersection between these uh, cells, the basaloid cells, and then some surrounding more hyalinized stroma. So this is a desmoplastic tricholoma, or sorry, a desmoplastic tricholoma. And it can look pretty bad depending on if you just get the central part of it, you can't, you, you can't really see that well encapsulated architecture. And here is a more, uh, typical architecture of a desmoplastic trichothelia or desmoplastic trichloma. And you see the central stroma here with that desmoplastic array, but then the outer portion of the tumor looks a lot more like a classic trichloma. Another great example of that desmoplastic change within the center of a traditional trichloma. So this would give you that diagnosis of a desmoplastic trichloma. Now, if you just saw this part, you might be thinking about some type of invasive squamous cell carcinoma um, because it's a pink looking spiculated neoplasm, right? Um, so you really have to get enough of the surrounding context here to be able to not overdiagnose this as some type of malignant squamous proliferation. On higher power, if you just looked at this without knowing the context, again, you might be concerned for a infiltrative squamous cell carcinoma. Because they can show these types of infiltrative features, I tend to comment on the margins on the biopsy and say, you know, it looks like it's out or it's not out and uh, conservative complete excision if it's not out, just to make sure that you don't have any other types of type of malignant transformation. So now we will kind of enter into the sweat gland neoplasms. So these comprise of many tumors that overlap and show features of both apocrine and eccrine differentiation. Most of them are benign, but they do have malignant counterparts. So thinking about the eccrine gland anatomy and histology here, so you, you have your acrosyringium at the top, you have your straight duct, and then you have your coil at the bottom. You can have um, development of some... Uh, sweat gland neoplasms along any part of this. In apocrine gland anatomy and histology, you'll find coiled part of the apocrine gland. And the most important thing is the budding type secretion that you're going to find at the apocrine secretory gland. So you'll find this kind of budding or pinching off with a lot more pinkish material within the lumen typically. Um, you'll also need to think about location of the tumor and um, for your normal anatomy and histology, the location of the glands, but in a tumor, it could arise anywhere that you've got um, normal African glands. However, you may get a mixed feature sweat gland neoplasm. And so you might be able to see both apocrine and eccrine features in both. We'll start out with a cylindroma. So a cylindroma is a benign sweat gland tumor. Typically on the scalp, it's likened to be a turban tumor where you see multiple lesions on the scalp. It can be skin colored. It's deep seated within the skin. And you might be able to see kind of a pinkish, um, pink to blue nodules. Often, like I said, on the head and neck, 90% can be located on the trunk or genitalia as well. Interestingly, these are more common in females than in males at a ratio of nine to one. There are some associated syndromes that we talked about earlier, brooks spiegler um, familial cylindromatosis, autosomal dominant with the CYLD mutation, high penetrance, but variable presentation. 
This often runs in the family of spiradenomas. And in, in fact, in the same specimen, you'll see oftentimes a feature of cylindroma and spiradenoma. And so you can call it a, a spiradocylindroma, or you can say predominantly spiradenoma, predominantly cylindroma. For test taking purposes, they'll probably just give you a tumor that has mostly predominantly one and ask you to identify that. We'll talk about the features. Again, I said these are often numerous um, nodules on the scalp. This is a lot more uh, striking example of cylindroma. So in pathology, you're going to find this jigsaw growth pattern where the puzzles, the puzzle piece kind of fits together. But from low power, you know, it may be difficult to exclude basal cell or something like that from just low power. So you got to go in on high power and really appreciate these thick basement membrane type separations where the puzzle pieces fit together. And so this is going to be your classic cylindroma. You do have a dual cell population within a cylindroma and you'll find some more compact, small purple nuclei, and then some larger nuclei with kind of more vesicular chromatin. So here's one type of cell, here's another type of cell. Um, and you'll find that these often have ductal differentiation. Again, remember these are sweat gland neoplasms at the end of the day. Just to summarize that, it's an intradermal proliferation of blue cellular lobules in a jigsaw pattern. You want to be able to notice that eosinophilic cuticle composed of base membrane material. You'll find some eosinophilic globules within the lobules and people call that hyaline drops. You can see these in spiradenomas as well and we'll point that out. Okay. You want to look for ductal lumina and the dual cell population. The dual cell population you can see in both cylindroma and spiradenoma. They are related and both result from CYLD mutations. So those peripheral cells typically have round, small hyperchromatic nuclei and scant cytoplasm, whereas the central cells have large oval vesicular nuclei and pale cytoplasm. Occasional mitotic figures are acceptable, but you don't want to see it tons of nuclear pleomorphism where you may have a malignant variant of a syndrome. So I will um, point out that the kind of larger nodules to the side of this puzzle piece like architecture, these could be in isolation considered spiradenomas because they're more of just like a larger blue ball and they have eosinophilic droplets and they don't have as much of those basophil or of those basement membrane like separations as eosinophilic basal um, separations. So it doesn't look as much like a puzzle piece over here as it does over here. And that's why I say that these are often running together in the same specimen. In this case, an excision, which demonstrates mostly cylindroma with some spiradenoma-like change over here. Just another good example of that jigsaw pattern puzzle here. You can notice these hyaline droplets scattered throughout. Another good example of those hyaline droplets here, the contrast in the image makes them look very hot pink. Just another example, again, this is one of the more beautiful tumors in dermatopathology, so it's always nice to admire them here. Spiradenoma, as I said, is a very related entity. Essentially, it's a, more of a blue ball that lacks those eosinophilic separations between the islands. It's usually solitary. Um, they're often tender clinically. You can see multiple lesions in Brooks Spiegler, as I said, they can occur on the really anywhere on the body. So head, neck, trunk, and arms. Again, looking at that and just being able to call it a spiradenoma is pretty much impossible. You're going to need to biopsy it. On pathology, you're going to see, like I said, big blue kind of islands that, in this case, there's really no um, cylindroma-like architecture to this. So this would be more of just a pure spiradenoma here. You're going to have an intradermal proliferation of lobules of basaloid cells, as I said, usually encapsulated with rich vasculature. The dual cell population that we discussed will be present in this tumor. Again, it's related to cylindroma, so not surprising. You should be able to find small ductal lumina, hyaline deposits, lymphocytic infiltrate and occasional mitotic activity is acceptable, but you don't want a lot of pleomorphism. Same with the cylindroma. If you do, then you'll have to think about a spiradenocarcinoma.
So just isolated islands, as we mentioned here, you'll notice two cell populations, the more compact nuclear um, purple nuclei with not a lot of cytoplasm, and then the larger cells with more uh, light colored cytoplasm and larger nuclei with vesicular chromatin. So here you see the more or the, the two different cellular populations. So you see a, a darker cell, you see a lighter cell, and then you also have some lymphocytes in this case. Spiradinocarcinoma, as it sounds, it is a more malignant form of a spiradinoma. So they arise in long-standing spiradinomas, and that's why it's important to kind of try to get out as many spiradinomas as you can in Brooks Spiegler patients. They present with changing in size, color, bleeding, and ulceration, as expected with any, any malignant tumor. They're typically sporadic and solitary, less frequently in the setting of Brooks Spiegler, actually. So um, interesting that, you know, some that a, a case of an entity that is making a lot of these, you know, you're not always going to be able to easily find them. You're mostly going to be able to find the spiradinomas or the cylindromas in Brooks Spiegler. Um, nevertheless, definitely every time you see these, it's going to be um, important to monitor for clinical change in size, color, bleeding, and ulceration, et cetera. On a tipia, not surprisingly, you'll find on pathology, not surprisingly, you'll find a lot of atypia, mitotic figures, necrosis, and infiltrated growth pattern. Here you can see a wide area of necrosis within the spiradinocarcinoma. Um, here was a residual spiradinoma to the left, and over here it became more of a malignant form to the right. Atypia, mitotic figures, infiltrative growth, all features of a malignant tumor. Moving on to syringocystadenoma papilliferum or SPAP. These are benign sweat gland tumors. They have secret uh, secretory differentiation. Typically, they're more of a blue tumor. Skin color to red, um, two to three, three millimeter papules or even two to three centimeter plaques in some cases. The majority do arise on the scalp or the neck. One third of the cases arise in association with the nevus sebaceous. Remember the other tumors that are associated with nevus sebaceous, like trichoblastoma, as well as um, syringocystadenoma papilliferum, and then basal cell carcinoma, for example. Here's an example of a syringocystadenoma papilliferum. You've got these group papules and nodules with scale and crust. Possibility of an associated nevus uh, sebaceous needs to be considered. I've had a case of one of these arising on the eye in a patient, and it was not changing, not growing for a really, really long time. And, um, you know, of course, there would be a concern for a sebaceous carcinoma, for example, but on biopsy, it looked like a syringocystadenoma papilliferum. So this is a, really a, a nice example of the invagination, the extensions of these fronds that are um, forming these papillations within a central void. You have acanthosis and papillomatosis architecture to the lesion, cystic invaginations with papillary projections that extend downward from the epidermis. It opens to the surface, and that is how you kind of think about an SPAP, syringocystinoma papilliferum, from an HPAP or a hydradinoma papilliferum. So the S you can think about it standing for connection to the surface and the H in a hydradinoma papilliferum, which we will talk about, it's considered H is standing for hiding below. And so it's not connecting to the overlying surface. The other thing you want to look for are numerous plasma cells sitting within the central portions of the cores of these fronds. Here's just another example of syringocystinoma papilliferum. You can get uh, syringocystadenocarcinoma papilliferums, unfortunately. Again, any malignant form of a benign tumor can arise. But this is what your benign tumors will look like. So you just have these fronds and projections. You have papillary growth, decapitation secretion of the cells lining the central lumen area or the central duct lumen. And then you have plasma cell-rich populations within the cores of these fronds. Another great example of plasma cells within the central core of the frond here. Also, you can see really nice example of decapitation secretion. 
In contrast, hydradenoma papilliferum, which is another benign sweat gland tumor with second secretory differentiation. It may show decapitation secretion. The classic presentation is on the vulva. So a vulvar dermal nodule will often be um, hydradenoma papilliferum. So here's a nodule on the vulva. And on pathology, you'll want to look for a well-circumscribed, um, we'll see here a well-circumscribed nodulocystic proliferation here. Um, you can see this apocrine secretion like change. You'll find a closely set papillary fronds, a pseudocapsule. A connection to the surface is rare, and that's why uh, you can think about an H in hydradenoma papilliform reminding you that it, it hides within the dermis or within the skin itself. Plasma cells are a lot less common in a hydradenoma papilliform as compared to a syringocyst adenoma papilliform. So you might have... Um, a, you know, a vulvar nodule that's biopsied here and it shows features of both the hydradenoma or it could, it, it looks like it could be some type of just bland cyst. It's lined by these cuboidal cells if you just get a really superficial section. But if you get a larger section, you'll be able to see a lot more cells uh, taking on that maze-like architecture. So you can think about a hydradenoma if, if it takes on this appearance. Again, this maze-like architecture, well set in the middle of the skin with no clear overlying connection to the overlying epidermis. You can see papillary growth, decapitation secretion. Now, there is a more aggressive tumor called a digital papillary adenocarcinoma, also known as aggressive digital papillary adenocarcinoma. The word aggressive is now kind of removed because the word, the, the name digital papillary adenocarcinoma just implies that it is aggressive. It can look a lot like a hydradenoma, papilliferum actually, or a hydradenoma, um, but it occurs on volar fingertips. And so if you have something that looks like a hydradenoma on the volar fingertip, you should definitely be worried about a digital papillary adenocarcinoma. It predominantly affects adults, but has been described in children as a skin colored to brown cystic nodule or mass measures from as small as a few millimeters to up to two centimeters. It's most commonly on the volar fingertip. The ratio of male to female is typically seven to one, and it's usually slow growing, but it's often painful. So that suggests that it is something to worry about first clinically, and then it's often biopsied. And um, now this is a lot more aggressive clinically, as you can tell, but sometimes they're not uh, declaring themselves yet. And you might just get a small nodule on the tip of the, the finger. They're poorly circumscribed infiltrating dermal tumors. They have solid areas of closely packed islands and nests of glandular epithelium. And they're typically protruding as papillae in the cystic areas. The cells are very pleomorphic. You can see a hyperchromatic nuclei. Mitotic activity is often marked and necrosis is sometimes present. So this is a good example here of a digital papillary adenocarcinoma. Um, from low power, it might look like something like a basal cell, but you can see that this definitely has ductal differentiation. There's some areas of um, necrosis. Look, this is a really large tumor here. So um, you can see the, the infiltrative architecture, the ductal differentiation. Um, so this is, a, this is why these tumors are so aggressive because they can start out small and then they become big pretty rapidly. You can see a solid tumor in some cases, a solid area in some areas and a cystic space in other areas. And this is why separating out from a nodular hydradenoma versus a digital papillary adenocarcinoma can be somewhat difficult. Um, and there are some uh, ways that you might be able to uh, tell them apart, but at the end of the day, it's more about the aggressive nature of the, the tumor, as well as the um, mitotic activity, the, the amount of atypia, um, as well as the location that's really gonna uh, seal the, the diagnosis.
glandular spaces are often uh, very frequent throughout this tumor as well. Mitotic activity being high in any tumor is going to put up a, a huge red flag and suggest that conservative but complete excision is recommended if even um, if it's not all out, but actually just in many cases, amputation is the next best step to completely remove these, these tumors. Unfortunately, they can metastasize as well. And so um, the first diagnosis could actually be a metastatic lesion. Um, Moving on to something completely not as dangerous as a digital papillary adenocarcinoma is a syringoma. So syringomas are benign adnexal neoplasms. They typically have ductal differentiation. They're more of a red or pink tumor as composed to some of the bluer tumors that we've been talking about. They show overlapping apocrine and eccrine lineage. On clinical appearance, you'll see smooth skin color to pink papules, usually multiple lesions. The most common location is the infraorbital region in the cheek. You also may have them appearing on the neck, the chest, the abdomen, the axilla, the penis, or the vulva. There's an eruptive syringoma variant, which often presents as brown hyperpigmented small papules on the anterior trunk, usually in darker skin patients or those with Down syndrome. Here you can see large proliferation of syringomas around the eyes here. So just lots of skin color papules. Here are multiple syringomas on the neck. You can see pink smooth papules on the chest and upper, the upper chest and the neck here. The lesions favor the ventral surface of the trunk, a distribution, a distribution pattern referred to as endemicuriosity. You can find eruptive syringomas anywhere, even on the penis in this example. On pathology, you'll find small symmetric well circumscribed proliferations of these tadpole-like structures with ductal differentiation. They present as small cords and strands and tubules resembling, comma, resembling commas or tadpoles, as I mentioned, with a surrounding fibrous sclerotic stroma, as you can see here. You'll find tubules which have a double layer of flattened cuboidal cells, and you can see intracytoplasmic lumina lined with cuticles. The lumina can contain eosinophilic material, as expected in this benign entity, you're not going to find a lot of nuclear pleomorphism or mitotic activity. You can have a clear cell variant of syringoma, which is associated with diabetes. Now, how are you going to separate this from a microcystic adnexal carcinoma? With a syringoma, you want to see it's uh, circumscribed and superficial. Like in this case, it's very superficial. With microcystic adnexal carcinomas, those are going to dive deeper and be uh, more infiltrative, often with perineural invasion, et cetera. So uh, syringoma is not going to have perineural invasion, and you're not going to see as many horn cysts in a syringoma as well. You're going to find a lot more duct-like structures in a syringoma. So here's this, just again, typical low power appearance of the epithelial strands and tubules and a dense fibrous stroma. Another example here of the ductal differentiated tadpole-like structures. Now, if you just have a superficial biopsy and it's extending down to the base, then you really can't completely rule out a microcystic adnexal. So oftentimes these are gonna need to be signed out as, um, you know, favoring syringoma. However, you cannot rule out a microcystic adnexal in that close clinical follow-up or a deeper biopsy if clinical concern persists. Uh, here you see tadpole-shaped ducts, again, thick collagen in between the islands of tumor. Again, really nice comma-shaped or tadpole-like structures. The design of this looks like a Paisley tie pattern. This is from Elston's textbook, and it just is a nice example of that Paisley tie tadpole comma shape pattern that you're going to see in a syringoma. More examples from Dr. Elston's textbook, tadpole shaped tubules, but more clear cells within these islands. And that's your clear cell syringoma that's often associated with diabetes. Your differential diagnosis for Paisley tie pattern includes four main entities. So the syringoma that we just talked about, 
the desmoplastic trichoepithelioma that we did talk about, the microcystic adnexal carcinoma, which looks a lot like a syringoma, but it's more infiltrative and has areas of um, perineural invasion, et cetera. So the best way to diagnose it on pathology is going to be atypia of the cells and infiltrative growth pattern. And then morpheiform basal, which often will look a lot like a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma in terms of the size of the island. But again, I said, you're going to have more retraction around the stroma uh, or more retraction around the islands with that stroma. You're going to have more cellular atypia. You'll have more BCL2 diffuse expression, and it's going to behave clinically much more aggressively than a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So pathologically, you, you'll find a more diffuse infiltrative tumor with perineural invasion and things like that. If you have any doubt on uh, the initial biopsy, it should be signed out descriptively as favoring one or the other, but not being able to exclude each other definitively in that conservative but complete excision or complete excision with negative margins is recommended. So moving on to microcystic adnexal carcinoma, it's a low-grade malignant proliferation displaying sweat gland and uh, follicular differentiation. The risk factors include UV or radiation therapy, um, older age, obviously. These present a skin color and often disc-like plaques or nodules, commonly located on the face, especially the chin, the upper cutaneous lip. They, when they're, by the time they're found, they're often quite large in diameter. So one centimeter in diameter with subclinical extension, very common. Perineural invasion may manifest with pain or even numbness of the involved area. Unfortunately, high risk of recurrence and local invasion if not completely removed. And so this is why most surgery and margin assessments going to be pretty important to make sure that you get as much out as possible. It looks pretty nondescript here. I mean, this patient has a lot of actinic damage here and some scattered telangiectasias, but you see this kind of uh, light pink to whitish papules uh, coalescing into plaques. It's probably indurated. It's probably got a, a deep quality to it clinically when you palpate it, and it's probably associated with some pain or numbness as well. So this is the, uh, in contrast to a syringoma, you can see this is a lot more extensive, right? So large microcysts, that's where that microcyst it comes in, adnexal, uh, because again, you've got that sweat gland differentiation and carcinoma because it has a keratinocyte base to it, right? Or it's got an epithelial base to it rather, but uh, microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Um, is more widespread, more infiltrative as compared to a syringoma, as, as we discussed. So a deep biopsy is essential to distinguish from a syringoma and a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. You will find that these tumors are asymmetric. They're deeply infiltrative. They extend to the sub-Q fat, unfortunately, or even the skeletal muscle. They've got scattered keratinizing cysts, as you see here. And they're typically present in the upper dermis. So if you have a superficial biopsy and you see these really large cysts, that's not very typical for a syringoma. Okay. You'll find dermal proliferation of epithelial cords and strands with ductal differentiation and intracytoplasmic lumina. You'll find sclerotic stroma, as you can see here in this picture. Generally mild cytologic atypia, unfortunately, so that, that's going to not be a helpful characteristic for us. It's going to be more about the invasive architecture. So these are often, unfortunately, caught later because, again, you see the clinical is not uh, that impressive, right? Very neural involvement and lymphoid aggregates are often seen. So here you can see a paisley tie pattern, again, looks a lot like a syringoma, right? And then some sclerotic stroma. So if you just saw something like this, you wouldn't be able to truly separate it out, right? And that's why a biopsy that really allows you to see the context and the, the depth of extension. This is a perineural invasion situation here. So you've got a nerve with um, the tumor cells wrapping around it here and kind of getting within the actual um, uh, nerve tissue itself. From low power, you can see some areas of lymphoid nodules, kind of like a, 
desmoplastic melanoma, where you have those lymphoid nodules that you can find throughout the tumor. You can see the tumor is extending. It's in the center here, but it's also extending all the way down to the edge of the, the picture. All right, moving on to hydrocystoma. This is a benign apocrine gland-derived epithelial line cyst. It's translucent to blue cystic papular nodule. Periorbital areas are very common, but can also be seen on the genitalia as well. Um, you can find them on the head and the neck and the trunk. Multiple lesions um, can be found in syndromes like Golt syndrome or shop schultz Bissard syndrome. Here is a translucent papule in the eyelid and nodule in the eyelid, and this is a hydrocystoma. Another example, this looks really worrisome because it's got a dark bluish to black hue to it. So uh, ruling out melanoma here would be completely appropriate, but the location around the eye of like a young person, it could just be a hydrocystoma that's got some, uh, you know, venous dilation or, or uh, maybe even some intraluminal hemorrhage within it. And it's giving you this appearance. They can be traumatized as well. Here's an example of a hydrocystoma on the ear. So their epithelial line cysts within the dermis, and they're typically unilocular, but they can be multilocular. You'll find thin flattened cyst walls with two cell layers thick, intercolumnar epithelium manifesting decapitation secretion, papillary projection sometimes evident, overlaps with apocrine cyst adenome. So oftentimes you'll, when they're biopsied, the fluid just kind of leaks out and we'll get these flattened cystic spaces with these cuboidal cells lining the entire area here. You can have areas where you've got more proliferation. And so you, most of it's gonna be this very thin cuboidal lining, but you may have some areas that look like they're more robust and you can have like a proliferating area within this hydrosystema. Again, just more flattened cystic structures with the bland cuboidal lining. Higher power from Dr. Elston's textbook showing you the cuboidal cells here. Sometimes, as I mentioned, you get some more robust proliferative areas of a hydrocystoma. Now, we're looking at an apocrine papillary cystadenoma, which is looks kind of similar um, to the hydrocystoma, except it's even more robust here. This particular example was cystic, but it contained both adenomatous and papillary components, so a mixture of more dense areas of uh, proliferation of the cells and then some more open cystic areas. This entity is called an apocrine papillary cystadenoma. Mixed tumors are, as they sound, they, are, they show a lot of different features, but the most important diagnosis um, or most important criteria for diagnosis is noticing a bluish kind of chondroid hue to the tumor. So uh, we will show examples of that here. Um, you can see this really nice blue background, bluish chondroid background to the tumor, but it's got a lot going on. It's got these keratin-like cysts, these reticulated strands of cells with maybe some ductal differentiation. Um, it's oftentimes they're circumscribed, pseudo-encapsulated. They've got a deep architecture, um, but they're they're still in the dermis and you can find multiple cyst-like spaces within a chondroid syringoma. So I just wanted to show you this first before we get into some of the factoids about a chondroid syringoma. So it's thought that it could be an adenoma or it could be a hamartoma, but most regarded as a hamartoma that shows folliculosebaceous and apocrine differentiation. So that's where that mixed tumor comes from. It's called chondroid because of the cartilaginous stroma, but unfortunately that's present in 50% or less of these. Now for the test purposes, they will show you one that has a chondroid background. They're not gonna expect you um, to make this diagnosis if it doesn't have that, at least for the uh, more basic dermatology assessments, but for uh, more advanced dermatopathology assessments, they may have you be able to diagnose a chondroid syringoma uh, without the chondroid background. These are going to be shown as solitary firm nodules, mostly on the head and neck. Here you see a, a very solitary firm papule that pretty much you're not going to be able to make that diagnosis 
of a chondroid syringoma until you do a biopsy. Again, just a kind of a deeper seated um, papule in this patient. So as I showed you, you're gonna see a circumscribed deep dermal tumor and it can get down into the sub Q. It's got what we consider as biophasic um, population. So you have epithelial structures and you have mesenchymal structures. So the epithelial structures are consisting of cuboidal cells most often with eosinophilic cytoplasm and cords and ducts, and you'll find some small tubules. These small tubules resemble syringomas, and that's where your duct differentiation is. You have some branching alveolar or longer branching tubules, and that kind of is reminiscent of the ducts and the secretory differentiation, the secretory differentiation rather. You can also see some cystic changes, squamous differentiation within keratocysts, sebaceous differentiation. Um, and so there's a lot going on in a mixed tumor. And, and often, if you can't identify what something is, definitely think about a mixed tumor. Would it classify as a mixed tumor? Because it's showing you so many mixed signals, as I like to think of it. Mesenchymal stroma um, will show you mixoid collagenous components. You might even see some bone formation, interestingly. The stromal cells will show myoepithelial differentiation. You can see um, S100 positivity as well as neuron-specific enolase and bimentin. As I mentioned, that chondroid matrix is present in 50% or less of cases. You don't want to see significant pleomorphism or mitotic activity in these. So just the scanning view again, showing you a well-circumscribed, pseudo-encapsulated, deep dermal nodule with multiple cysts. The chondroid background, this is your chondroid syringome. Here is a picture from Elston showing small little tubules in a chondroid matrix. Again, beautiful picture from Dr. Elston's textbook showing you those small tubules within a chondroid matrix. Here is another example of the alveolar spaces that you can get. So they're more longer, they're branching. I mean, they're longer, they're branching, and they have these um, more cystic dilated spaces with Secretary, secretory material in it, and a background of this chondroid uh, stroma here. You can see the branching ducts throughout. Again, here's another example from Dr. Elson's textbook with the branching ducts, chondroid background. Here, again, that alveolar pattern, and you can see the pale mixoid stroma. So this doesn't have as much of a blue hue as the previous examples. Um, and this, so again, this would be probably the majority of your mixed tumors or chondroid syringomas. Again, that branching alveolar pattern, mixoid stroma with fat as well. Another example showing fatty infiltration and mixoid change. All right, moving on to one of my favorite groups of adnexal tumors, the acrospiroma family. So this is a generic term for tumors with poroid or terminal ductal differentiation of the acrosyringium. The more superficial um, location of the tumor corresponds with hydro hydroacanthoma simplex. When it gets a little bit deeper, but it still has a connection to the overlying epidermis, that's called a poroma. When it's in the dermis without an overlying connection, that's considered a dermal duct tumor. When you have a proliferation of poroid cells that have nodular and cystic spaces, that's called a nodular hydradenoma. You can have a clear cell variant of a hydradenoma as well. And then in real life, adnexal tumors don't like to read the textbooks. And so you can have hybrid forms of, of all of this. So looking at the location again, hydroacanthoma simplex are going to be mostly in the um, epidermis. It's the intraepidermal paroma. Aromas are going to extend down deeper. Dermal duct tumors are in the dermis, but they don't have an overlying connection. And a nodular hydranoma is a nodular proliferation composed of cystic and solid spaces with squamatization and clear cells. So the hallmark unifying theme of these acrospiromas are that they are composed of poroid cells. And so poroid cells are cuboidal cells with oval nuclei, pink cytoplasm, you might be able to find a lot of cuticle line ducts in most of these entities. And 
um, location can, can sometimes help you here. I, I usually just rely on the pathologic features to make the diagnosis. Now, paroma and dermal duct tumor fit into categories of basaloid dermal nodules because when you often are looking at a paroma, you may not see the overlying um, connection in the majority of the tumor. It's, it could be a bottom heavy type proliferation. So to go back to the hydroacanthoma simplex, commonly, or it's uh, commonly clinically misdiagnosed as a seborrheic keratosis or a basal cell carcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Mostly common on the distal extremities. Clinically, it's a hyperkeratotic erythematous to brown plaque, predominantly in the elderly. On pathology, you'll see intrapernormal nests of cuboidal cells with ample pink cytoplasm. You can see some phenomenon called Borstiotison phenomenon, where you have discrete cellular epidermal proliferations. You can see this Borstiotison phenomenon in SCC, clonal SKs, and hydroacanthoma simplex. Cuticle line ducts are a feature. So here you see these kind of nests of cells that have a clonal appearance to them. That's the Borstiotison phenomenon. Again, the, what makes this a hydroacanthoma simplex versus a clonal seborrheic keratosis, well, it's that these are derived from those poroid cells, right? So this is a sweat gland derived um, differentiation. So you'll, you should be able to find some of those cuticle line ducts, really small duct-like areas throughout the tumor. They're really small, actually. Um, and they're the same ducts that you're going to find in a paroma. So this is essentially an intraepidermal paroma. Here's a uh, more clear example from Elson's textbook. You can see these are the proliferation of the acrosyringeal cells and these really small holes, right? These cuticle line ducts throughout the neoplasm. Here again, another small duct, cuticle line duct. You can see they just look like little holes within the clonal expansion of cells, clonal expansion of the acrosyringeal keratinocytes. Paroma, that's where you start to have what we just saw, but down a little bit deeper into the dermis. These are smooth erythematous papules, plaques, and nodules. Acral sites are favored, but they may be located in other areas. Surface erosion or ulceration may be seen, and they're usually asymptomatic, but they can be painful. Here's an example of a paroma. Another example clinically. So again, on pathology, it's you're going to look for poroid cells that are cuboidal with oval nuclei and pink cytoplasm, cuticle line ducts with pink sweat within the ducts, sebaceous differentiation and decapitation secretion and apocrine variants, and vascular stroma. So here you see an anastomosing pattern connecting to the epidermis. Again, cuticle lined um, small duct in the poroid population. More examples of the poroid proliferation of cells. It's been thought that these, um, if there was any uh, superficial sample here, you might think it looks a little bit monotonous like an SK. And so um, now these are lacking the uh, significant pseudocyst that you're going to see in a seborrheic keratosis, but it's been shown that EMA often stains poroid cells a lot more strongly than uh, keratinocytes of seborrheic keratosis, according to some of the literature. But again, you really want to go based off of the histologic features you're seeing. So this is a paroma. Again, you're going to want to look for those small cuticle line ducts. Dermal duct tumors are essentially paromas that don't have a clear overlying connection to the epidermis. So here you see dermal nests of acrosyringeal cells with no clear overlying connection. Um, this, this is a pretty superficial location of the nest here. So I would, to be very definitive, um, calling it a dermal duct tumor, you probably want to cut deeper throughout and make sure that there's absolutely no connection that's, that's noticed um, because it could just be that this is a paroma that's out of the plainest section of the connection, the overlying epidermis. That being said, at the end of the day, it's important just to put it in a benign adnexal category and to demonstrate that it has features of dermal duct tumor um, with these cuticle line ducts, uh, poroid population, et cetera. Nodular hydradenoma, these occur 
in all um, patients, male or female, but mostly they're in females over 40 years, usually solitary skin color to erythematous nodules. They are often located on the head, neck, and extremities. On pathology, you're going to see a large dermal nodule with cuboidal cells and pink, uh, ample pink cytoplasm, clear cytoplasm in areas of the tumor with small, dark, eccentrically located nuclei. You'll find cuticle uh, lined ducts, variably lined cystic cavities, tumor lobules surrounded by a definite stroma, which can be fibrovascular, uh, collagenous, or islandized. It may be pigmented as well with increased melanin or colonization of pigmented dendritic cells. So clinically, this looks worrisome. You have this um, irritated, growing, ulcerated nodule. So it's definitely worth a biopsy in this. Um, it's a solitary violaceous nodule in the abdomen with serous drainage in this patient. So definitely lots of worrisome things on the differential. But when you look at the when you look at the histopathology, you find a well-circumscribed nodule with solid and cystic spaces On higher power. You're going to find um, these monotonous poroid cells with areas of clear cell differentiation. And this is a, a result of glycogen accumulation within the cells. So it kind of reminds me of, a por uh, I mean, it kind of reminds me of a trichloma, the clear cells. But this is, uh, in contrast to a trichloma, which is derived from the outer root sheath, this is a perone, or this is a more of the porid family. So it's technically a sweat gland tumor, right? But it looks very similar in, in many ways. But you don't have um, really that thick eosinophilic rim in the nodular hydradenomas. In this picture, it actually looks like you could confuse it for a, 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 a eosinophilic rim. So you really got to go back to the architecture. And look at the low power and you see this deeper seated nodule with solid and cystic spaces. So you wouldn't confuse this with a trichloma on the left. So take into account the low power architecture. Um, don't just go zooming in right on high power and then lose the context of the tumor itself. Again, more clear cells within the choroid population. It can be very clear. So you start to get into the clear clear cell nodular hydradenoma variant. You have these areas of hyalinization, even squamatization appearance. That's very common in your nodular hydradenomas. So you can try to correlate what you're seeing clinically and with the microscopic features. So what gives you that vascular appearance? It's a highly vascularized stroma. What gives you the firmness? It's the stromal sclerosis. What gives you that cystic appearance? It's the cystic dilation of the neoplastic epithelium. And what gives you the pigmentation? Either lesional hemorrhage or intercalated pigmented dendritic melanocytes. As with all of the tumors we've discussed today, you can have a malignant acrospiroma or a malignant form of a aroma, so porocarcinoma. It may develop de novo or in association within an existing paroma, maybe of apricot or eccrine lineage. It may show both. And on pathology, again, you're going to look for the same features you look for any malignant tumor, invasive growth pattern, atypia, mitotic activity, and necrosis. So unfortunately, here is an example of a porocarcinoma with rapid growth, erosion, and ulceration accompanying this um, malignant porocarcinoma. So they obviously are looking uh, really infiltrative and invasive here. This is uh, looks like it's on, it's on the foot of a patient. Uh, same area that a paroma would be on, right? So if you see a paroma clinically, um, definitely want to biopsy it out and make sure that there's no malignant transformation happening in any of that tumor. So here's a eccrine porocarcinoma. This example uh, arose in a pre-existing benign paroma. And you can see the benign paroma above in the invasive tumor below. So if you see a paroma on the, the foot or anywhere, um, it's, it's a good idea to try to get as deep as possible. If it comes back as a paroma, then it's definitely, uh, you have to correlate clinically, but conservative but complete excision would be advised to make sure you're not missing a, an infiltrative aspect to the paroma. Syringofibradenomas are an interesting tumor. They're rare. They're usually located on the limbs. They're on the limbs. They're 
reactive um, in many cases versus a neoplastic proliferation. Um, so it's considered that there could be some reactivity in the tissue inducing the uh, formation of the syringofibroadenoma, where you get these networks of thin strands of epithelial cells extending down from the epidermis. Looks a lot like a fibrofolliculoma in a lot of ways, uh, or a fibroepithelioma of pincus. They, all three of these tumors look very similar, but the syringofibroadenoma, you're going to actually have ductal structures within those thin reticulated strands. You can have a fibroid mix, a fibromyxoid stroma. Again, that can make it confusing between a fibroepithelioma of pincus, but again, you'll, you'll want to look for those ductal structures. Syringofibroadenomas are associated with Clouston syndrome or shop schulz bessard syndrome, and it's been described in association with chronic stasis, dermatitis, bullous pemphigoid, epidermolysis, bullosa acquisita, different ulcerations, et cetera. So because they're found in association with ulcers, it's been thought that there is some type of reactive induction of these neoplasms. So here you can see, um, you know, there's no way to be able to tell exactly what you're looking at. It's kind of this like diffuse plaque-like growth. Um, on biopsy, you're going to find that there are numerous anastomosing strands of epithelium surrounded by a cellular fibrous stroma. And you see these little duct-like lumens here? So that is going to help tip you off that this is a syringofibroadenoma. Your differential diagnosis on pathology, you might be considering a tumor of the follicular infundibulum. To me, this doesn't have the plate-like growth pattern as a, uh, that a, a tumor of the follicular infundibulum has, and you wouldn't find the duct-like structures. A fibroepithelioma of pincus, I typically find they're more diffuse. They're larger than this. They've got um, a lot more mucin associated with it. You might find some retraction around the anastomosing strands, some areas that actually look like a basal cell carcinoma as well with more basaloid uh, staining and peripheral palisading in contrast to this tumor, the syringofibroadenoma. And you wouldn't find these duct-like structures in a fibroepithelium of pincus as well. Um, fibrofolliculoma could look similar to this, but I, again, am going to bring your attention to the duct-like structures. That could be the only uh, deciding factor, but of course you want to correlate with your clinical scenario as well as some other features that you may be finding. So in your uh, fibrofolliculoma, you may find some areas that look like there's more of keratin-like cyst structures, as opposed to um, syringofibroadenoma, uh, you're not going to find as many of those keratin cyst-like structures. Again, another example of those really nice uh, ductal structures here uh, among the anastomosing strands. The epithelium itself is composed of pretty small cells, pretty uniform small cells that contain eosinophilic cytoplasm and maybe some small hyperchromatic nuclei here and there. The ductal differentiation is present and that's the key. Moving on to papillary eccrine adenoma and tubular apocrine adenoma. So these are benign neoplasms with apocrine differentiation. Papillary adenomas are often found on the distal extremities of young African-American patients, tubular adenoma rather, are often found on the scalp and the cheeks, as well as the axilla. They may arise in association with the nevus sebaceous. So papillary eccrine adenoma and tubular apocrine adenoma, they're well circumscribed dermal and sometimes uh, subcutaneous proliferations with a tubular pattern or a papillary pattern. So that's really where these, uh, they're, they're very related, but that's where uh, you're going to kind of make your diagnosis. If it's more of a tubular pattern, it's going to be the tubular apocrine adenoma. If it's more papillary, it's going to be the papillary eccrine adenoma. With the papillary pattern, you'll see these rounded glandular spaces with luminal papillary projections, as you would imagine, based on the name. And combination of these two entities is common. And so that's why they're kind of lumped together. So here you see a papillary eccrine adenoma. You can see actual papillary growth into the central areas of the lumen here. So the lesions composed of dilated ducts and cysts dispersed in a fiber strong. Here you see on acral skin, these large tubules here. So you can be thinking, um, so when you see this material within the lumen, you can be thinking of an eccrine differentiation. 
And because it's on acral skin, right, you can think about the papillary adenoma because that's often on the distal extremities. But if you don't see papillary projections, you may be looking at a tubular adenoma, right? And here you can actually see the papillary projection. So I would put this, put this at a papillary eccrine adenoma based on location and based on the papillary projections. So here you can see a tubular apocrine adenoma pattern. It's a very circular uh, duct structures and then some little papillary projections. The tubular apocrine adenoma is going to have more apocrine secretion and that's what makes you think about a tubular apocrine adenoma versus a papillary eccrine adenoma. Again, mixed features are possible. So you can see um, entities that might be more eccrine, entities that may be more apocrine. So here it's more of a tubular apocrine adenoma pattern because you have apocrine secretion in a lot of these areas. The papillary eccrine adenoma, you see the actual finger-like projections within to the wound. We'll discuss this entity called adenoid cystic carcinoma. These are rare. Um, they can be nodules or plaques on the scalp and trunk. The classic morphology is islands of tumor cells with numerous ducts that give you a cribriform appearance. You can see perineal invasion, infiltrative growth pattern, and cytologic atypia, which can be pretty mild. And the mitotic activity of these can also be pretty infrequent. So here is your adenoid cystic carcinoma. You see a primary cutaneous adenoid cystic carcinoma composed of basalate epithelium forming cords and ductal structures, kind of infiltrating down it even into the subcutis. Another example of an adenoid cystic carcinoma, this low power view just shows you the expansive nature of the tumor. Um, it's on the scalp in this case, and you see duct formation throughout with intensely basophilic epithelium. Usually with the adenoid cystic carcinoma, it looks more like a like an adenocarcinoma. So in compared to a microcystic adnexal carcinoma, you don't see a lot of those keratin-like cysts in this, um, in this tumor, right? So you might have been thinking about some microcystic adnexal carcinoma. However, you don't see those large epi, you know, um, epidermal inclusion cyst-like structures. The other thing is this looks a lot more like an adenocarcinoma. So you should think of adenoid cystic carcinoma. And like I said, the microcystic adnexal carcinoma is often occur on the face. This occurred on the scalp, et cetera. So use as much information as possible as you can. Um, at the end of the day, uh, these adnexal tumors can look very similar as well. So you got to look for subtle hints to be able to classify the correct diagnosis. Unfortunately, these can have perineal invasion, just like a microcystic adnexal carcinoma too. But I hope that you can appreciate this more adenocarcinoma-like um, morphology to the tumor. This is an example of perineural infiltration by an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Again, more uh, great examples of this kind of large adenocarcinoma-like neoplasm, this carcinoma, adenocystic carcinoma. You've got lots of cyst-like spaces, has uh, lots of secretory material within each of those lumens often filled with lots of mucin within the lumens as well. So your differential could include um, basically like a basal cell carcinoma that has um, an adenocystic uh, pattern to it. Mucin mucinous carcinoma is a low-grade malignant sweat gland tumor characterized by abundant mucin. Skin colored to gray and rubbery, boggy nodules or plaques, usually one to several centimeters in size on the trunk um, or on the head and neck, but sometimes on the axilla and trunk, particularly around the eyelid though. And I've seen a lot of cases around the eyelid. Clinically, these have a high recurrence rate and they unfortunately may metastasize to lymph nodes, particularly those originating in the axilla. And the key is to rule out metastatic mucinous adenocarcinoma. So if you see one of these, um, the, the goal is to differentiate between primary mucinous carcinoma and metastatic mucinous adenocarcinoma, which could come from the gastrointestinal or the mammary. So uh, 
full body, you know, clinical correlation, uh, imaging correlation with making sure that there's absolutely no other, um, adenocarcinoma in the body of these patients. So here you see this large, um, nodular growth on around the periorbital region of the patient. And it can get quite massive actually on pathology. You're going to see what people call C of mucin. So you'll find tons and tons of mucin. And then these islands just kind of floating within the mucin. So this is your mucinous carcinoma. As I mentioned, you'll want to see these epithelial tumor islands dispersed within the lakes of bluish mucin separated by the fibrovascular septa. So here are your fibrovascular septa separating out that mucinous carcinoma. The tumor cells are unfortunately pretty bland, so that doesn't help you a lot. However, this is a distinctive histopathologic picture. These pools of mucin with these uh, islands of um, neoplasm within the, the center separated by the fibrovascular cores. They also have a low mitotic rate, so that doesn't help you either. Um, however, if, if you had clinical scenario like this, you, you wouldn't really care, right? This is obviously malignantly behaving. Um, they present as a solid tumor mass, but they can show continuity within the epidermis. So this is pretty well throughout the dermis. You can see how large it is because the overlying epidermis is, is pretty thin here. It's pretty small. Um, so it's expansive. It's, it's filling up that dermis with the tumor. It's producing tons and tons of mucin in here. Um, and so these islands actually look like they're floating within the pool of mucin. Here is another example of those floating islands within here is kind of a whitish void, but this was, a uh, heavily, uh, filled with mucin as well. Eccrine angiomatous hamartoma is a benign proliferation of eccrine glands and blood vessels. You can see these onset at birth or childhood as solitary or multiple nodules or plaques. They're located on the distal extremities and they can have an asymptomatic or tender, they can be asymptomatic or tender rather. They're associated with hyperhidrosis or hypertrichosis. So we actually discussed this entity in our vascular lecture that we just uh, per, that we just uploaded here onto the YouTube channel, because you can have a coexistence of a vascular uh, proliferation of the blood vessels, and that's where that hamartomatous, angiomatous hamartomatous uh, descriptor comes in. But then you have your eccrine glands as well. So here's that picture we showed you of this kind of ill-defined bruise-like plaque. And on the biopsy, you'll see multiple eccrine lobules surrounded by vascular elements. Again, just another example of eccrine coil and ducts all kind of anastomosing together here. And that is it for the adnexal uh, brief overview. So the best way to learn these is going to be um, seeing real life cases, as well as uh, as many digital slides and still pictures as you possibly can uh, see. And the more you kind of see examples and the more you familiarize yourself, the easier they will be to um, render your diagnosis. So for testing purposes, they should give you more classic examples. However, in real life, as I mentioned, Dr. Rapini said, classifying snowflakes is easier. Thank you for your attention.